All right, okay. How'd this compare to some belt? Huh? Andrew, I'm not sure, buddy. Um, I, you know, I, I, we did media days. It was about the size of that room right there. And everybody walked around. And all of us were there at the same time. I guess, what are your feelings, you know, anxious this morning? I know, I know you're year two, but, you know, debut here at SEC media days. Um, no, I don't, I'm not really anxious. Uh, it's just part of it. Um, excited to talk Mizzou football, talk about our team and what we, we're going to be able to try to accomplish this year. There's a lot of things that um, our team has done to put themselves in a position to have a, a good season. Um, obviously, you got to perform, um, but we all know that the, the separation is in the preparation, and I think our team and staff have done a nice job preparing for the opportunity, um, and we're anxious to get going. Can you talk about your decision to bring the Case and appeal here today? Yeah, you know, the, the number one question I get is what did I learn in the SEC the last year? And, and for me, it was you, you got to win at the line of scrimmage. Um, and when you look at our team, those guys have played a lot of football for us. Um, and they're seniors and they're leaders. And, and we've got some really good players um, that are younger that haven't quite had the experience that those two guys got. And so when you talk about representing our state and the blue collar mentality, I think it always is going to start in the lines of scrimmage. And I think Case is a guy that that um, does all the right things for us, uh, represents our program the right way. He's a captain. Akil Byers is a guy who, who uh, has played a lot of football for us and has put in all the work and, and really leads in, in his own way. And so I think he's a great representative for Mizzou football. Coach, we've seen you all across the state from Royals games to – Cardinals game starting off the first pitch the other night, and then also even at the Moberly racetrack. Yeah. Uh, why, why is that important to you to, to get around so much and, and be active in, in Missouri? It's our state, right? And, and you got to embrace all of it. And, and, you know, I've talked about the spirit of Mizzou is, is not just Kansas City and St. Louis. It's rural Missouri also. And uh, being able to identify with all kinds, of, all kinds of people and say, hey, we need all of your support. We don't just need St. Louis. We don't just need Kansas City. We need rural Missouri. We need the people from Springfield and Branson and, and, the, and uh, the Boot Hill. We need everybody. And uh, it's my job to go get them and, and ask them to come. It's their job to respond, but they can't respond if I don't ask. Coach, uh, Oklahoma, Texas stuff. I just wonder what, uh, what, how you processed any of that. Well, I mean, I've been saying for years we're the best conference in college football, and, and obviously uh, those places uh, want to join us, and, and uh, maybe we were trendsetters, you know, leaving the Big 12, and maybe that opened the door and gave them courage to try it too. I don't know. Um, but obviously we got a great commissioner, and uh, I trust that uh, uh, he's going to do what's in the best interest of our conference. Um, and... So that's really up to him. I don't think it's going to change our schedule this year, but I am prepared for Mark Womack to put both the Texas and OU on our schedule like he did last year with LSU. And, um, you know, along then, those lines, I mean, it, this is before your time, but I do wonder with the, the sense of, you know, more flux coming and, and realignment potentially, it, how, uh, how, how advisable you think it was for Missouri to have done what it did 10 years ago and make this move? Well, I'm glad they did. I mean, it, probably opened the door for me to be here. Um, we're the best conference in college football. Uh, and so to be a part of it is a special thing. And, and it's obvious that we're, you know, our commissioner is going to always put us in a position to maintain that status with forward thinking. And, and obviously Mizzou did a nice job of that 10 years ago. Eli, a big topic this week. Is your, do, is your sister in the Tokyo Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it's been vaccination. Are, are you able to say where you are relative to the 85% threshold and just what your message has been to the team? Yeah. Um, you know, I think for me that's a, a, a interesting topic, right, because when you're in a position of leadership, you have to – you've been given an awesome platform, right, and you've got to – to weigh the outcomes of what you endorse. Um, and so for me, when I think about vaccinations, I think about what if I'm wrong, right? So if I say it's up to each individual decision and I'm wrong about that, the consequences of not getting the COVID vaccine are death. My brother's a hospital administrator in Joplin, Missouri, and they're bad. I mean, they're in the firefight right now for people's lives. 
And so the reality of it is, if you're wrong on not getting the vaccine, you're going to die. All right? It's not an argument of whether or not you're going to get COVID. People are going to get COVID if you're going to deal with the results of that. And, and it is death. It's not certain death. Some people fight it off. Some people don't. Everybody's different. There's all kinds of age groups right now that are really struggling with it. And it's a choice to get the vaccine. Then you weigh up, okay, what if I endorse the vaccine? Um, what's the side effects? Well, so far, uh, if I'm wrong on endorsing the vaccine, I don't know what the side effects are, right? Oh, the long term, long term. Well, it's been seven months since I've been vaccinated and I'm doing okay. I haven't lost any more hair than, than coaching the SEC schedule. So we are in doing everything we can to gain a competitive advantage and endorse getting the vaccine because that's what we need to do in order to take care of our neighbor. It's not, I don't believe it's a personal choice. It, it, it is a personal choice, but it has consequences, just like any action you have has consequences. And so I'm encouraging people to get the vaccine. Our staff's at about 95% ratio. Um, our team is is really trending in the right direction. Um, you know, we had a, a, our first shot vaccine with some of our guys, so I don't want to sit here and tell you a number because it's changing constantly. But I feel very confident But by the time we start fall camp, uh, we will be at the SEC threshold if they don't change the number again. Has it been at all hard to come to that stance to be more insistent just because of all the sensitivity to it, or you just feel like it's really clear that this is what we have to no, it's, demand? No, it's been hard, and I don't demand it from our players. I, I demand from them that they be transparent about who they are, and if they don't want to get a vaccine, then they have to be. In, we have to enforce the meet, greet, and eat rules and make sure that they protect the team because you don't want to be in a situation like NC State where you have a chance to win a championship. And, and as a leader, I didn't do, you know, didn't do everything I could to prevent the spread. Look, COVID is, uh, you know, like anything right now, become a political football. I don't believe it needs to be a political football. I believe it needs to be uh, <laughs> there are people dying, right, because of this disease. It didn't disappear after the election. It wasn't the simulation. It, I mean, it, what, what do we – what? If we're, wor if we're worried about long-term outcomes of the vaccine, we've seen this COVID situation for nearly 18 months. Like, we have to do something. We, it's, it's within our opportunity to do something. Um, I don't know. You know, I read all of this conspiracy theory that, that this might be some sort of government ploy, but they're posting it on social media. They might need to be wor more worried about whether or not <laughs> they're being tracked on social media than whether or not they're being tracked by a vaccine. You know, I don't know. So, there you go. Eli, does your relationship with your brother, and I'm sure he's super busy, but does that give you unique insight into all of this? How helpful is that? <laughs> well, he's in the thick of it. Yeah, I mean, I've got a brother who's a uh, hospital administrator. I've got a brother in law who's a pediatrician. I've got a sister that's a neonatal nurse, a physical therapist, a sonographer. So, we're pretty much covered in the healthcare field. Um, and they're, they're, it's real. I mean, it's, it's real. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, there's people in our community who've lost loved ones to COVID. And that's, that's the reality. There was a pretty um, interesting article that was released yesterday that I read about um, where doctors are dealing with people that are asking for the vaccine right before they get put on a ventilator. It's too late. Um, and it's all preventable. It's like I told our team, we ask you to get your ankles taped, not to prevent you from spraining your ankle, but prevents you from missing a game. And that's what the vaccine gives you the opportunity to do, prevents you from missing game time. And that's really why. It's a prevention method and an opportunity. And I don't get a lot of pushback about taping your ankles. <laughs> what do you think of the, the new name, image, and likeness law uh, for Governor Parson signed? And what was your relationship with getting that thing signed, did you say? Um, I think I was probably just more of a It'd be like Case Cook. I was more of the right guard. You know, I had an opportunity to block for it, but I didn't really get to carry the football at all. Um, you know, and went and, and tried to do what I could to explain the significance and why it's important. Um, you know, I think for NIL, it really comes down to three things. There's going to be those that watch what happened, those that wonder what happened, and those that make things happen. I think it's an opportunity for Mizzou to make things happen. You know, our greatest advantage and one of the reasons that I chose Mizzou was because um, – 
that it is surrounded by two large metropolitan cities in Kansas City and St. Louis. We have 10 Fortune 500 companies. We are the only Division I playing school in the state. Um, and what an opportunity for everybody to get behind our players, our programs, our athletes at the University of Missouri and support them with name, image, and likeness. Um, you know, I, the collegiate model, all that stuff, like, you know, I, Coach Fisher said it, not me, but he said people have been doing name, image, and likeness for years, and now it's legal. I'm just saying, hey, it's time for Mizzou to really engage in that and, and try to give uh, our football program, our basketball programs, the greatest advantage they can. Have you seen it have any sort of advantages thus far? I know it's only been a couple weeks. But. Well, the, the Coach Saban said his quarterback's making nearly a million dollars, so that's going to be an advantage in recruiting. Um, you know, it is what it is. I do tell our team that comparison's the thief of joy. Uh, you got to run your own race. Don't worry about what everybody else is making. Worry about what your opportunities are. And if you get caught up in, in worrying about somebody else, you're going to miss the blessing that's right in front of your life, which is an opportunity to play in the SEC, get a quality education in a great community. And if that leads to endorsement deals, then count your blessings. Um, you know, I've been very blessed to, to, to do what I do, and I don't get caught up in, in chasing anybody else's dreams or worrying about their life. I enjoy what I do right now, and that would be my message to them too. Eli, I know you uh, were pushing big for the big football indoor facility this offseason. You know, yeah. just to see in your, you know, two years almost after you were hired here, you know, this is where things stand. Are you happy with the progress that it's come this far, or and where do things kind of stand with that right now? With the indoor, or the progress of the, of the program, the indoor, and I guess progress overall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things that was attracted to this job was what there was still growth potential, right? There was still a, the ability to do things that have never been done before at the University of Missouri and. One of those things is to continue to improve our facilities. Obviously, the southeast end zone is a great step, but you know we asked boosters and the administration to take the next step and get going on the indoor. I would have liked it for it to have been done yesterday, um, but, but we're working as fast as we possibly can to acquire the steel, and uh, we've done an outstanding job raising funds uh, for that. You know, I think the progress, um, it's one step at a time. You know, I think our fan base, we're, we're clearly known as a show-me state. They expect that, that, that uh, we catch Georgia and Florida like yesterday. Um, but we got to realize that both of those guys have a little bit of a head start on us. Um, I think Kerb, Coach Smart's going into year five and Coach Mullen's going into year four and I'm going into year two. So we got to crawl before we can walk. Um, I need the fans to really re-engage like they've never re-engaged before. I hope they're excited about what we're trying to do. But I need the fans in the stands. I need them to buy t buy season tickets. That's the greatest way to show off fan support. If you can't buy season tickets, we need mini pack tickets. But what's going to help us more than anything is Faro uh, Field to be sold out, to be ferocious, uh, to to support our football team. Does that mean that we're going to uh, have a, a dream season this year? I don't know. I, I don't know that. But regardless, I need fans to b believe in the message and understand that we're building something. And uh, our staff, our players are putting in the work, our administration's believing in that investment, and, and I hope that the fans will too. I hope that they'll come back, stir the echoes, and, and say, yeah, we're back in on Mizzou. When, kind of speaking of, of re-engaging the fans, I, I know a lot of fans have been kind of drawn to the personality you've shown in interviews, social media, et cetera. I, I guess, how do you kind of straddle the line between being yourself, putting yourself out there, not being brash, not drawing fines from the league office, stuff like that? I don't comment about the league stuff, man. <laughs> I, I stay away from that. Um, you can start. I will. I gotta, I'm what they call new money, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not really giving away money right now. I think some of these other guys have had money for a long time, so they don't, it doesn't quite matter as much to them. My wife would kill me. Um, she still lets me live off that Auburn salary. But... Uh, <laughs> I don't, what's the question? No, how do I draw the line between brash? I just focus on, I, I just, I am who I am. I do carry the weight of, all right, what's the negative impact if I say something really stupid? You know, learned a couple of lessons last year when I picked a fight with Kirk Street and called somebody Lou Saban. But, you know, it is what it is. Live and learn. With yeah. that kind of effort to re-engage and get people on board, do you view this today as an opportunity to do that? Some coaches would rather probably not attend. SEC media days, you've known what this day, this week is about, and have, you know, you're, you follow what guys say here. Is it an opportunity to kind of fire people up even more? Do you look forward to this? Uh, I think look, some coaches don't. Yeah, no, coaches. shoot. Every, I'm a brand ambassador for the University of Missouri. So anytime we get a chance to, to, uh, to promote our brand and, and push Mizzou football, that's my job. 
uh, and, and they pay me a hell, whole hell of a lot of money to do my job. So I embrace it with everything I have and, and understand that the real reality is, is the wins on Saturdays, but this is part of it. And, uh, you know, I'm living the dream. Like I, I told you last night, like I'm driving up to this hotel, I remember in 2006, I was a high school football coach at Springdale, Arkansas, coaching in the Southeast Select Hoover 7-on-7 seven seven tournament. We drove over to the Galleria between, you know, pool play and tournament play later that night and had lunch. SEC media days were going on. And to think that, you know, 14 years later you're here or 15 years later you're here as the head coach of an SEC program, like, you don't take that for granted. You don't know what opportunities are going to come and go in life. And, and uh, every day's a gift, so shoot. Dave, nice pants. Like this. <laughs> uh, when, when you look at this team going into camp, you mentioned line of scrimmage. Are there areas that kind of give you a sense of comfort? Do you know what you have, kind of identif the identity of this team? I think everywhere you kind of anticipate what's going in, and then in, in fall camp you either reconfirm it or throw it out the window. Obviously, I think the defensive line should be a strength of our football team. It needs to be. Um, I think one of the best advantages we had was the return of the three senior defensive linemen and Chris Turner and uh, Akil Byers and Kobe Whiteside. You return all SEC performer and Trajan Jeff Coat. Isaiah McGuire started a lot of games for us. Um, Darius Robinson is poised to have a big season. You brought in two uh, junior college transfers with Realis George and Daniel Robledo. Really love our freshman class that came in. Johnny Walker's been outstanding in the weight room. Jatorian Hansford has really uh, done an excellent job of getting his body right quick off the edge. Um, hope that Makai Wingo can have an impact and, and looks to be able to do that. So I think that room should be solid, um, but we'll see. You know, we brought in some known quant uh, known quantity, I don't know the word, known quantities, qualities. We brought in some known people as far as the transfer portal who've had experience as players, both with Blaze, uh, Caleb, and Ali, um, which should give us a lot of comfort on the defensive side of the ball. You know, we replaced – we lost five players in the NFL draft, and we replaced uh, five players in the, in the transfer portal at those five positions. So, um, you know, we'll hope that those guys prove what they can do here and maybe raise their level. I was going to ask you about the cornerback room. What did adding a Caleb and Alley do for that group in particular? Yeah, the only thing better than a little competition is a lot of competition. Um, and, and we had seen some attrition, and I think there was some worry uh, throughout, you know, the Twitterverse uh, about that. But... We, we have a plan for everything, and, and, and some things that aren't known doesn't mean that there wasn't a plan in place. And, and uh, so feel really good about, obviously, Caleb and Allie being able to play at a high level with their length. Obviously, we know Ennis and Ish uh, have played in this league a lot and, and really excited about what Chris Abrams' drain uh, has done growing as a DB. Um, so, you know, we're going to be based more of a four-two-five team, so – basically three corners on the field at a time, and, and we really feel like now we have the depth that we need in order to sustain excellence at those positions. You like how, how much different, it's probably hard to quantify, but how much different do you feel this year going into this season than you would have last year? I mean, I'm sure you learned a lot last year, but there were a lot of things that were kind of warped by COVID too. Yeah, there's just a sense of, I wouldn't say comfort, but of calm because I have a little bit more knowns of what we're going into, whether it's strength and weaknesses, a little bit knowns of what we're facing. Um, you know, going into this time last year, I had no idea if we would be able to – I had no idea who our starting quarterback was and then changed it. So this year we know who our quarterback is. We know who our strengths are. Now it's really about fine-tuning what we need to get. Um, there's just a different sense of going into fall camp. The goals for fall camp are different. Uh, than they were last year. Last year we were trying to identify who could play, who couldn't play, what quality depth we were going to be, lay the foundations for our schemes. That's really not the plan. We've already done that. Um, now it's about, okay, let's get these people up to speed. Let's see if this person can contribute. Let's put our guys in situational football. Um, you know, it's a totally different plan. So well, you won't have to go back to any of this, but, I mean, I just keep thinking about what a scramble it was to have to do everything through – the early days of COVID and all the restrictions and all that. How do you how do you feel like you'll look back on what that did for the program? How much it either set you back or accelerated? Sorry, Mako just said said the fit looking sharp hand clap. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Yeah, that looks nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
You were saying what? Just, just really, COVID really threw off. Yeah, the rhythm, program, like a text right? message, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you got a text message. So it just really threw off how you had to implement the program. Do you think in some ways it accelerated some things or mostly just scrambled things? I mean, because you had to do things differently. You know, there were some, <laughs> there were some hard days last year. Um, and I wrote on my whiteboard, 2020, the foundation of a championship. And what it did was remind me that don't sacrifice what I wanted uh, most for what I wanted right now. And so every decision we made was, all right, how do I ensure that we don't sacrifice the culture of who we are and what we want um, for some short-term monetary ease the pressure of the pain? And I think... We saw that. I mean, I'm not going to hide behind. We, we had quite a few people leave the program. Um, that wasn't intentional, but it was intentional in the fact that we were going to identify exactly who we are, exactly the goals and standards of the program, and we weren't going to bend off of those. And um, I don't know if it accelerated it or didn't accelerate that, um, but it really, for me, reinforced that we're going to do the things that we know to do in order to be successful, uh, and we're not going to come off of it. But speaking of goals in the program, you've also done quite a bit of work for uh, future classes uh, at Missouri. Just wondered how you how you rate your off season for, for the class of 2022 and beyond. Your accent took me out. Where are you from? <laughs> uh, Kentucky. Yeah, well, yeah I, I knew those guys were a lot further north than we were. Scotland. Scotland. Yeah, yeah nice. Um, well, look, it's hard to rate uh, recruiting classes, you know, right, but. I do think we're recruiting at a high level. Um, I'm challenging our coaches every day to continue to recruit at a high level. Uh, don't be satisfied with where we're at. Always continue to push to be better. Um, you know, for us, building a team is always going to start with recruiting high school football players and then supplement the needs that you have through the transfer portal and through junior college talent. So um, this should be a relatively small class just based on what the NCAA rules said and did with COVID. Um, so, I, you know, I think we're at maybe 12 commitments or something like that right now, and we'll probably top it off at maybe 15 to 16 and then see what our needs are after the season. You talked a lot about your goals this spring. How do things shift? What's different between spring camp and now once you're getting closer to the season? Yeah, in spring camp, there's not a game coming. Um, in fall camp, you're, you're fixing to play for keeps. Uh, and once they kick off September 4th, all bets are off. Um, it's win or lose, and, and if you lose, you're going home, you know. And so, uh, I think there's an urgency to the way you practice. There's an urgency in in every day that you don't waste that time, don't waste that day. Sometimes in spring, it's really about you know. For us, it was more about individual player development. In, in fall camp, it's about scheme development. It's about team development as far as understanding and being able to play at a high level so that you can win week one. And that's what we're, we, our focus will be. And that's really the mindset of what our players are. They're, they're training every day with that, that mindset. But you said before that, you know, games in this league are won in the trenches. What do you think it says? You know, you brought two guys that work in the trenches. Other schools might wear their flashiest players. You know what I mean? What, what do you think that says? What kind of message are you hoping it sends? Well, I hope it sends that um, to really two things. One is for our community that we're a blue-collar community. You know, and that if you work hard, you may not, not always be the flashiest. Missouri's not always uh, the flashiest, uh, but we're hard workers. The people of Missouri, the state of Missouri, are hard workers, and they're in the trenches, and they're the unsung heroes, and, and that's really what our, our team with Akil and, and Case is, and hopefully it sends a message to recruits, too, that, hey, man, you want to come win in the trenches? We'll put you on TV. One last you question, y'all. Well, you mentioned earlier that one of the knowns you didn't have this time last year as a starting quarterback, just, yeah. just having a full off season as that guy, wh where does that put Connor compared to this time last year? <laughs> well, he's actually training at full speed. Last year he was recovering from an ACL and wasn't going full speed, so he's had a full off season in college football, which is huge for him and his growth. You know, went to the Manning Passing Academy. He just he has a whole new sense of confidence in who he is and control of this football team.